Welcome back to another episode of the Aaron Werner podcast on iCode Media. And again, excited to have my good friend, John Rompakis, Dr. John Rompakis, back joining with us today. Uh, he and I get into lots of fun conversations and uh, told him we want to record these because I think that if it's helping me in my practice, it'll certainly help uh, everyone who's listening. And uh, today we might get into a topic that we're going to get into a topic that might uh, drive a little bit of emotion for some of us. Um, and the way that I, I visualize uh, my conversation with John um, relates well to an experience I had earlier this week. I, my wife teaches high school and I was at the high school. I watched a lacrosse game, which was super exciting. Uh, at the same time, really, really frustrating because I know nothing about lacrosse. And so I was trying to apply the, the rules of soccer or football or basketball sports that I do know to lacrosse. And so some of the, the plays and, um, and the calls made sense and some of them didn't at all. And it was really tough to, to figure out what was going on. And I feel uh, very grateful and sorry for the mom sitting next to me because I kept asking her lots of questions, <laughs> mostly of what's going on and what the heck was that call, right? Um, but uh, so I don't know if it was a me applying the right rules to the wrong game or the wrong rules to the right game. Uh, we can debate schema- uh, semantics. Um, but I think that we find ourselves in that place a lot in, um, in optometry, especially when we're working with third-party payers and things that we feel should be right, things that we feel should should work a certain way, and maybe we find out they do or they don't. Um, so I, I was talking with John and said, hey, help, help me understand and walk me through medically necessary contact lenses. That seems to be a, a hot topic um, with lots of confusion. You ask 10 people their opinions, and I usually get 15 different answers back. And I uh, just so wanted to, to go to an expert. And, and uh, so John and I had a good talk, um, and uh, we want to repeat that talk here. So hopefully it's... Uh, it drives value for all of you. Um, if you've got questions, you know, we'll put the contact info in the show notes. Please reach out. We certainly want this to be a conversation. So you ready for this, John? Uh, let's roll. <laughs> all right. So medically necessary contact lenses. Start us off. Well, so I think your analogy of your lacrosse game is actually really good. Um, as you probably, if you're depending on if your team was winning or if they were losing... <laughs> your emotion, right? Your amount of anger at, you know, why are we losing? That rule doesn't make any sense, right? That's where, you know, that the parallels exist in medically necessary contact lenses. So as we know, medically necessary contact lenses are a benefit that some vision plans carry. Now, when I say that, I didn't notice I didn't say vision carriers. You know, most managed vision carriers do have medically necessary uh, protocols or plans uh, or benefits within their different plans. Not all plans within a carrier's portfolio carry the medically necessary contact benefit. So if I were to use IMED as an example, not all of IMED's plans have the medically necessary contact lens benefit. That's something that the ultimate consumer who's buying the policy is going to end up deciding whether they want that as a provision of their policy or a benefit of their policy. Um, you know, the the reason that there is so much confusion, Aaron, is that there are different rules for every carrier. Not every carrier has the same requirements uh, to qualify for the medically necessary benefit contact lens rule. And it becomes very frustrating because it means that your office, if you're going to have an area of specialty within your practice, it really means you have to have one of your team really stay on top of what those rules are and be able to have instant access to them via the web or the, you know, the company's website or a professional relations, uh, publication, something along those lines, so they can understand, uh, you know, what those rules are for that particular plan that that patient has, because they do vary. The problem that I see from our profession is that we look at this as a huge profit center within practices. And I will tell you that what I'm going to say, as you said earlier, is going to drive emotion in some. Uh, Frankly, I think a lot of people will be very upset at what I have to say, because um, the amount of revenue that's re Uh, retrieved by the carriers via medically necessary contact lens audits is huge. The average audit for medically necessary contact lens audit is in the $150,000 to $175,000 range. 
because that's how bad these policies are being abused. And I think that sometimes what makes me a little, um, I'm going to say wary, you know, is that I have personally, first person heard well-respected contact lens specialists within our field on the podium touting how they bill for medically necessary contact lenses. And they will actually uh, say on the podium that they don't care what the rules are. This is how I do it. This is how I make, you know, three, four thousand dollars of fit. And I'm, you know, I refuse to get paid the eight hundred dollars or five hundred dollars or the twelve hundred dollars that the plan allows because, you know, I'm entitled to make more money on that. And, you know, the problem is, is that if you're a contracted provider with a particular carrier, you can't just choose what part of the plan you want to be part of. Either you're part of it or you're not part of it. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, that part is very upsetting to me because I think that many go to CE lectures and they listen to these individuals who have such great clinical skills in solving patients' problems and then they hear these types of comments on how to uh, bill for them. And it's it's so far away from the truth. I think it's putting the audience member in jeopardy if they follow those things. So first thing I'd say when we approach medically necessary contact lenses is understand that there's two parts of what you would approach. Number one, does the patient qualify for the benefit? That's a binary answer. Yes, they qualify no, they don't, right? And um, for example, I'm reading here from a policy that I just downloaded this morning, okay? So it's fresh and current. There's different qualifications for a plan to qualify for it. So it'll normally come up and say, what are the qualifying conditions that you have to have? So typical things, ANISO of, greater, of three diopters or greater in any given meridian, high uh, amotropia exceeding plus or minus 10 diopters, right? Keratoconus is there actually called out more specifically in most policies. Many carriers have a mild to moderate keratoconus qualification or a, a severe uh, keratoconus qualification. So you have to be very specific about how you're viewing that. Obviously, um, uh, certain uh, aspects of vision improvement. So for example, in many keratoconic benefits, they'll talk about being able to, uh, if the patient can't be corrected to 2025 or better. And then for non-keratoconus patients, they'll talk about being able to obtain a visual acuity, best corrected visual acuity benefit of two or more lines with contact lenses than with standard spectacles. So you have to make sure that you're the, for the particular plan, the very first step is to determine, does the patient qualify for the benefit? Mm -hmm. And then determine whether or not, um, if that, once they do, then do I meet the requirements of that? Yes or no? And then what type of lens do they need to fit? And this is where I think many of the things come off the rails. I think a lot of people have viewed in the past that since they qualify for a medically necessary contact lens benefit, that then the patient automatically qualifies for the highest level of reimbursement under that given plan. And that's not true whatsoever. You actually have to assess what type of uh, qualification is in place and then what is the best correction for that individual. Um, so, you know, I think those are some of the, the, you know, areas I'd like to explore in our conversation and then talk about medical record keeping and then also touch on the fact that many of the carriers use improper or non-standard CPT coding that you and I are, you know, held to this certain rule. And yet the carriers mm -hmm. say in our contract with this particular provision, we want you to use this, right? For example, one carrier that I'm aware of, doesn't even use a contact lens fit code for uh, most of their medically necessary contact lenses. They want to use 92071 fitting of a contact lens for ocular surface disease. That's what we use for bandage contact lens. Yeah. Yet that's one of the codes that they specify must be used to fit a medically necessary contact lens. It's not right, but it is what their contract says. And if you're going to bill under that contract, you have to follow what that contract, you know, 
requires. So, yeah. and I think I want to pause there because I think you're making a, a very good point on that. You know, we've agreed to go into a relationship with a a third party payer, and um, and I know this very well on the HR side, especially being in California, just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's right or legal. Uh, so the you know the the payer can determine the rules, and we've agreed to them. We also have the opportunity not to agree to them and no longer participate in that panel. But when we do, the burden's on our shoulders to know the rules of the game. Right. Right. And I think it's unfair. I mean, it's you know, I in my in my world, if I'm being held to a standard to follow the CPT rules and the ICD ten rules. I think a carrier is you know, required to do that as well. Unfortunately, that's not what exists today with managed vision care companies in many respects because they're not technically insurance companies. And so they um, can skirt some of those you know, situations, whereas maybe a more uh, a formal you know, insurer is going to have yeah. to you know, follow the, the CPT guidelines that we have. Yeah. I'm glad you said that and, and acknowledged it because I do think it's, it's unfair and it's, it's okay to call that out. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to play by the rules of whichever game we're we're playing and who we're playing with. It's really difficult because the practitioner, as you said, the burdens on the practitioner. And you know, when I defend uh, doctors in these uh, medically necessary contact lens audits, the amount of medical record keeping that has to take place is a huge burden, right? It's more than your standard contact lens fit, mm-hmm. right? There's no question about it, and. The fact is, is that they have to maintain, you know, if I'm going to accept 15 different managed vision care plans in my office, I may have to have 15 different sets of medically necessary contact lens rules that I have to be very well versed on. And, you know, we get busy, you know, you get, you want to solve your patient's problems and we get, I'm not going to say lazy, but, you know, it's just that things happen because it's hard to keep track of that many things. And right. so it's a difficult arena. And believe me, they, you know, their reimbursements are higher than standard. And so, you know, oftentimes they'll say, Hey, look, you know, we're going to audit you and it's a great recovery you know, stream for us. And I think the other frustration that we see quite a bit is that, you know, uh, good clinicians always want to use the best technology they possibly can for a patient. Oh. And oftentimes the allowance that the carrier will provide for the lens or the materials doesn't even cover the cost of, you know, the right. entire contact lens fit and everything like that doesn't even cost the, cover the cost of the materials. So, you know, we'll offer some suggestions on that as well. Uh, so that way people can get appropriate reimbursement if they have to use a lens uh, that, you know, has a much higher cost. Uh, it's not foolproof, but it has been successful in many situations. Cool. Awesome. So we were talking about how uh, we need to make sure the patient qualifies, right? And knowing yep. that the individual qualifications for, uh, for each of the different plans, right? And yep. not looking at each payer as a broad scope, but what are the different plans they have? Right. So let's talk right. about the, the billing side of it, the fit side of it, right? Okay, so let me give you two different situations, right? I can have a patient that is a keratoconus patient that requires a scleral lens, uh, contact lens fit. That's a very difficult individual. They qualify for the plan. And let's just say the plan gives a $1,200 allowance or whatever it may be, right? So that's, mm-hmm. you know, everything they do. So that's pretty straightforward, right? That I'm going to be billing for my, uh, the process of a keratoconus patient. We'll talk about the specific CPT codes and the follow-up um, uh, rules and things like that. But let's take a patient that is minus three OD, minus six and a quarter OS, sphere, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to fit them with daily disposable contact lenses. Neither one is a high RX, right? Mm -hmm. So what do I charge for that? Well, what are my usual and customary charges for what would I, what would I charge a minus six and a quarter spherical patient, you know, for a daily disposable contact lens. So a lot of people want to say, but I want the $1,200 because that's what I'm allowed under the medically necessary contact lens benefit. And I'll say, but if I walked in off the street and you fit me with, I didn't have any insurance at all. And you fit me with a minus three 
and a minus six and a quarter or whatever that, uh, you know, uh, vertex adjusted RX right. of that would be, wh what would you charge me? Oh, it's going to be, you know, 350 or 400 bucks, right? That's the fees that we have to bill for the medically necessary contact lens benefit at the same time because it's our usual and customary fee. So we have to approach those without bias or discrimination. If your fit requires, you know, you, you have to you have to provide the service that the fit requires, right? If I have a, you know, minus 12 sphere contact lens, right? And I'm within the standard parameters of what a contact lens company provides for that. Still medically necessary, still a spherical contact lens fit, yeah. right? Not billing at the maximum allowable just because that's what the benefit actually is. And that's where a lot of the cost recoveries on audits actually come from. They come from two areas primarily, that we don't record the medical necessity. In other words, what particular condition qualified the patient for the benefit? And then did I record everything in the uh, you know, record that I needed to, to demonstrate that I did get the benefit um, of doing that? So you can't imagine how many... Um, charts I review that we don't even have uh, visual acuities recorded for the patient wearing the new contact lenses to show a demonstrable improvement in VAs over their specs, right? I mean, simple things like that, that they're just not in there. And I think part of it is, you know, maybe the fault of the EHRs are not well laid out for all of those types of things. And, you know, um, I think that could be addressed. But nonetheless, the practitioner really needs to have those um, items in there. And since many of these contact lens uh, situations are also monocular, not necessarily binocular, it's, mm -hmm. it's important that you take monocular VAs uh, as well. So OD, OSOU in all, in all situations. Of course, you're going to want to have you know, your appropriate evaluation of the patient pre-contact lens. You're going to want to have their you know, uh, corneal, you know, measurements, those types of things, your over refraction on a monocular basis with visual acuities, all of those types of things, please, you know, you're going to want to have <clears throat> notations of centration and fit and, you know, uh, yeah. uh, all of those types of things, uh, movement on blink, you know, all the things that you wouldn't normally have, but for whatever reason, I see absent in a great deal of records that, you know, uh, get audited. And I think that that's where people actually have a huge amount of exposure. Well, that makes sense. And uh, I, I don't think for a, a minute on a glaucoma patient, we would neglect to, to document everything that we did and, and the details of our findings. Um, so it makes sense that if we're uh, charging or billing a, a higher fee because the contact lens is now uh, medically necessary and not elective, right? We would need right. that same sort of documentation. Right. Now, a couple of things that I will tell you, I, can we focus on keratoconus just a bit? Please. Yeah. So the CPT code for keratic, fitting a patient with a keratoconic uh, who has keratoconus, excuse me, fitting a patient who has keratoconus, that CPT code is 92072. The CPT mm -hmm. book specifically says that covers the initial fitting and any subsequent visits should be covered with a 99,000 code or 92,000 ophthalmological office visit code. So, and 92012 in that particular situation. Keep in mind, and I'm going to go to your glaucoma analogy since you just mentioned that. When we prescribe something for glaucoma, we prescribe a medication, we see the patient for a follow-up visit, if you can view the contact lens as being analogous to the drug, right? I'm not doing a contact lens check. I'm not checking the contact lens. What I'm checking is the cornea, right? And its response to the contact lens that we're using mm -hmm. to treat the corneal condition of keratoconus. So when I'm billing, right, I can, I can also do, there's two sides of this, right? Medically necessary contact lens is where I'm billing the managed vision care company for the fit and the materials. And then I can also, after the stated follow-up period that I have to provide for uh, the contract, what it requires, because uh, many vision care plans require that you follow them for at least 30 days or 60 days. It depends on the particular policy. But after that, I'm able to bill the medical carrier 
for the, the progress evaluations to evaluate how the cornea is responding to the lens. If I need to change the lens after I've dispensed it, right? Because remember, the original fit isn't done until I'm ready to write what that prescription is, that contact lens yep. prescription. Once I've done that, and once I've satisfied that follow-up period, if I need to adjust the fit in any other way other than the power, right? If I need to change peripheral curves, if I need to change diameter, anything like that, that is considered to be a new fit, another 92072, okay? So obviously you may have annual limitations within your plan, uh, managed vision care benefits, right? So those things may be billable to the patient uh, directly or billable to the patient's medical insurance, depending on what they have for provisions as well. But mm -hmm. it's very important to realize that your follow-up visits are billed to the medical carrier after the stated follow-up period that the managed vision care company requires, those are billed using typically a 99,000 code with the diagnosis of keratoconus um, uh, for those because it's a medical visit, you know, for a medical condition. And that's, that's really, really important to do that. Um, so a lot of people get confused on the keratoconus uh, code. Um, so that's what you would fit. Typically, if you're ordering the lenses, then that's where you specify the lens type, whether it's a scleral lens or whether it's a soft toric lens or whatever you're using to treat it. That's described through the V code of the materials, right? Um, but if you're mm -hmm. fitting a patient for the condition of keratoconus, you have to use the 92072 code as your fit. Even if you were going to fit a scleral lens, right? We don't use the typical yep. scleral fit code uh, on doing that. Yep. So let me ask you this, the, the, nine, the, the 92072 code, while not necessarily a procedure code, can you think of it like a, a, a procedure code? Because you're doing something, doing a procedure, it, in this case, you're fitting a contact lens. Right? Exactly. So it, it's under the yeah. special ophthalmic, um, it's in the, under the special ophthalmic testing section of mm -hmm. the CPT within the contact lens services section. So yeah. uh, just like 92071 is the process of fitting of a contact lens for, you know, um, uh, ocular surface disease or injury, uh, 92072 is fitting of a contact lens for the condition of keratoconus. Yep. And it, it, it is a initial... bilateral code, by the way. And, and so it's, uh, you know, you're, you're fitting, uh, technically you're fitting both eyes under that code. So, it, you know, I think that that's where, where I see a lot of people, um, they're, they believe that once I've gotten that my maximum payment from the managed vision care company, that I'm supposed to produce this package of follow-up care for an entire year. That's not, that's not true. I'm assessing this patient, whatever frequency you determine is being clinically appropriate, and I'm billing the medical carrier for those uh, visits, right? And yeah. um I hear a lot of people from the podium say that, you know, they charge like $3,000 or $4,000 for this, you know, annual package. And that's their fit in one year worth of follow-up. And I would say that that's, um, you know, and they're ignoring the managed vision care benefit situation. So I, you know, I think they're just, I mean, forgive me for saying this, but I think they're profiteering and not paying attention to the, to what the rules are on that. But a better way to approach it is you might say, Mrs. Jones, you know, you have a condition called keratoconus. You have a benefit under your managed vision care company for the initial fit of those lenses and a specific follow-up period. Under your medical plan, you'll typically have coverage as well for the other visits that we're going to have throughout the year. We typically see the annual cost of this to be $2,500 or so or whatever it may be, right? I mean, yep. you can tell them what the annual expense is anticipated to be or what you've experienced it to be with other individuals under the plan, um, but realize that you're not allowed to balance bill, right? You can, if you normally charge a patient off the street $2,500 uh, and how you do that, and your allowance under the managed vision care plan is 1,200, you cannot balance bill for that $1,300 on doing that. Mm -hmm. This is a maximum allowable under the plan that you've agreed to participate in. And that's where I think a lot of people are going to be unhappy with what I'm saying. I want you to be as profitable as everybody. I just want you to keep the money that you make. 
right? Yeah. Instead of having to give it back on an audit. Yeah. And let me ask you this, because I think that, and I agree with you a hundred percent on, and I appreciate the frustration of, you know, I could get X, but I'm only getting Y uh, because we need to uh, apply the, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the third party payer benefits. What sparks an audit most often in these cases? Is it a patient who said, Hey, I just paid three grand for a treatment and shouldn't insurance cover that. So I'm going to call my insurance company and say, don't you have a benefit on this? You know, why am I paying cash? That's absolutely one source. They see uh, a lot, uh, you know, specific frequency, you know, that is going to stand out as well yeah. uh, on doing things. I think a lot of times also that um, it's how you use your diagnoses that are, you know, appropriate or inappropriate on in doing things. Um, I will tell you that most of the policies that I see, the specific contract provisions for medically necessary contact lenses, the carriers are not shy about telling you, we audit these records frequently to ensure that you're applying the benefits properly, right? I mean, they tell you right up front. Um, yeah. I'm just looking. Well, it makes sense that they would if they're paying out extra. You're, right. you're going to double check that there's that there's extra. Yeah, um, I'm just. I was trying to look for just used. their. Um, oh, here it says. We regularly review clinical records to make sure you're correctly applying the medically necessary contact lens benefit. We check whether the documented prescription supports a qualifying condition submitted on the original claim. You know, if the clinical record doesn't support the condition, we can recoup any overpayment by withholding payment on any future claims where laws permit. We can consider any inaccurate submission to be a false claim. Falsifying information or filing false claims can result in disciplinary actions up to and including termination from the appropriate network. And we are required to report it to regulatory and law enforcement agencies as appropriate. Right. I mean, yeah. they kind of just lay it out for you there. The other thing in, in keratoconus, Aaron, is funny is that the, um, you know, when I when I <laughs> I hear people, you know, who send me questions all the time, they mm-hmm. say. Oh, but I've got advanced keratoconus and I use that diagnosis. I said, well, what diagnosis is advanced keratoconus or mild keratoconus or anything? There's no such thing, right? Keratoconus has just a couple of different diagnoses, right? It has unspecified keratoconus. And then there's obviously unspecified right eye, unspecified left, unspecified uh, bilateral and unspecified unspecified eye right? Then you've got stable keratoconus, O-D-O-S-O-U, and unspecified. And then you've got unstable keratoconus. Those are your three choices. And um, when I see a lot of audits, it's because people are using unspecified keratoconus as the diagnosis rather than stable or unstable. Um, I think that it's important to Look to the bodies like the International Keratoconus Association and other, you know, clinical individuals to talk about what are the standards for stability or uh, for a condition to be considered stable or unstable. Uh, I'm not qualified to speak to that, um, but you want to make sure that your medical record does substantiate whatever ICD-10 code you are actually using uh, for that. One common misperception also is that irregular astigmatism is a qualification. Um, Many plans don't actually have that as a qualifying condition uh, for medically necessary contact lenses. So if you're making that assumption because you would think it makes kind of common sense, please check your individual plan ahead of time uh, to make sure that it has that provision uh, in there. The Myopia Collective. Cooper Vision and the AOA have partnered in a groundbreaking initiative to change the way optometrists in the U.S. treat children with myopia. The purpose of the Myopia Collective is to rally the profession of optometry and its allies to interrupt the status quo and elevate the new standard of care for children with myopia. Every individual is encouraged to become a member of the collective. By joining, you commit to taking action to help slow the progression of myopia in children. 
You'll receive updates and information about the collective and its work in the fight against myopia, gain access to educational opportunities and resources offered by the collective, and hear from change agents, the ambassador optometrists selected to serve as advocates for community and policy change that facilitates the mission of the collective. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the show notes to join the collective today. In the past, our focus revolved around prescribing MacuHealth or MacuHealth Plus to patients at risk of macular degeneration, while also recommending it to collegiate and professional athletes for enhanced contrast sensitivity and sports performance. However, this year's introduction of the Life Meter has been a game changer. The Life Meter revealed a concerning truth. Many of my patients have alarmingly low skin carotenoid levels, indicating potential deficiencies in essential body tissues like the retina and brain. Supported by over 30 peer-reviewed publications, LifeMeter's accuracy, consistency, and effectiveness has been demonstrated across 2,000 subjects with diverse backgrounds. With this newfound insight, I can now have meaningful conversations about carotenoid levels with all of my patients, even those who may seem outwardly healthy. To learn more about this empowering technology, feel free to contact your MacuHealth representative or click on the link in the show notes. Together, let's optimize patient care and elevate their well-being. Cool. And while we're talking about checking the plans, what are uh, what are the, the the good resources and maybe the not so good resources we should consider? Um, and I'm inclined, if I have a question, just to call a number, try to talk to somebody, you know, plead my case and, and get a response back. Um, it, it, where do you go for the authority that I can then fall back on? Should it be questioned well, later? To, to be very honest with you, it is extremely easy to get these policies online. Most, if you're a contracted provider with them, you can go right to the carrier's website and you can search for, or, uh, you know, uh, have right on the surface there, the content medically necessary contact lens policy, uh, br- just prior to our, you know, us getting on to record today, um, I went online and just typed in medically necessary contact lenses into Google or medically necessary contact lens policies. I must have had five or six different carriers come up and just right there I could I could have access to those policies. That I'm not advocating that you do that, right? Because I don't know whether those are the most current policies, if they're cached, if they apply to the plans that I'm specifically contracted for. That's why I want to go to the carrier's website, log in with my you know, provider username and password and get the actual information. And that's where I think that, you know, staying on top of this is both the most important, but also one of the most difficult things that, you know, uh, you know, for a practitioner to do just because it takes time. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, overly burdensome. I'd love there to see some uniformity across all of the managed vision care carriers to say, this is what a medically con- uh, necessary contact lens benefit is and not have to memorize 15 different plans, but be able to say, great, we have a national standard that that's what occurs. And, you know, if anybody from a managed vision care plan is listening to this podcast, I would encourage <laughs> you guys, you know, work with the NAVCP and get some form of uniformity in coverage. So that way, not only do the patients benefit, but it makes the burden and the compliance much easier for the practitioner to be able to do. Amen. You know, I, I mean, I, I just that. think, yeah, I mean, it's really important, but I don't know. You know, it's, it seems like, as you said earlier, common sense doesn't always prevail in, in this arena, right? So, nope, not uh, always. It's important. Although I, so, you know, although I do I mean, think I, that, I was going to say, although I, I do think, though, um, it's not on our, our it's, it's not on us to know the answers right now today, right? So I'm, I'm jumping back into the clinic. I've got a patient in the chair, a new patient, um, uh, keratoconic, and uh, I don't necessarily need to be able to say, Hey, you qualify, you don't qualify. Here's exactly your benefits. Right. right. I, I, I'm going to say, Hey, you've got something that we need to evaluate further. I'm going to schedule you back while in the meantime, I'm going to do some research to see what benefits you have under your, um, under, right. under your, your, your insurance plans, your third, your uh, managed vision care plans, whatnot. Um, so it gives me some time. Mm-hmm. It lets them know that I'm working on their behalf. Uh, I'm not promising anything. I'm just going to see what you have available. It, well, you know, and I also think it gives you the perfect opportunity to segue into that conversation immediately 
If you don't have coverage, Mrs. Smith, this is typically how the process goes, and this is what the expected annual costs are going to be. You know, some of these may be billable to your medical carrier. They often are, you know. I mean, so there's a lot of ways to uh, to approach that, you know, um, with the patient. But you're right. Maybe so. everybody's so quick to, you know, want to get that done on the same day that that's where many of the mistakes are made. But I like your approach where it's, you know, you have them back. You do your appropriate workup. You make sure that you know what the qualifications are so you know exactly what testing you're supposed to do to support that. And then you can, you know, move forward with your recommended, you know, recommended fit and follow-up schedule uh, for that patient. Yep. I like that. So if you want to see what that looks like in action, go, go have your kids get braces because orthodontics know how to have that conversation perfectly. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of scanning through some different uh, carrier policies here uh, that I've, you know, taken as uh, just the liberty of, of doing things. Um, you know, I think that there's, you know, again, I, I talk about why it's important to do things. I'm looking at um, one plan here that says, you know, we accept the diagnosis of unspecified keratoconus, right, as an approved diagnosis. Now, it doesn't mean they don't audit that if you know what they have, because having an, an approved diagnosis and just, you know, be, being able to say, hey, I've got this code and I've got this diagnosis and I can get paid doesn't mean that you're safe from an audit, right? Because if you know whether it's stable or unstable, remember, the obligation is on you to be most specific as possible, um, and again, I would say the other thing is, is that, uh, docs generally do not have, um, the, uh, spectacle correction, you know, best, you know, corrected visual acuities in their record and show a demonstrable change with the contact lens, uh, in order to qualify for that. But yet that's the qualification that they're using, uh, to, to fit somebody into the package. So, um, yeah. The other thing I would talk to you about is, you know, myopia management. Um, currently, right now, uh, under the medically necessary contact lens policy, I don't know of any exact coverage that a managed vision care company has for that. I do know of um, a medical carrier that is covering medical uh, that is covering myopia management under the medical plan, not under the managed vision care plan. Um, it only covers two different types of lenses um, that are uh, FDA approved for uh, controlling myopia, uh, to my understanding. Um, I don't know what the reimbursements are uh, for that, but I will tell you that um, when I hear people talking about um, pathological myopia and all of these other types of things, these again are are made up diagnoses. Um, I don't know if anybody's just gone into the ICD-10 and uh, looked up myopia. There's really um, just two kinds of myopia, right? There's myopia and then there's degenerative myopia. And when you're talking about degenerative myopia, you're generally looking at uh, certain axial length measurements, right? And dioptric shifts uh, that, that occur. So I think the uh, you know, where you're looking at different cutoffs are, you know, typically greater than minus six or minus eight axial length. I'm trying to think it was 38 millimeters, something like that along those lines of things. Not exact on that, but those okay. are the um, two diagnoses that you have to choose from. Uh, but currently right now, I'm not aware of them being covered under any uh, managed vision care companies, uh, medically necessary contact lens benefits. Um, that's out there. It, it may go that direction. I know that there's much discussion about that going on right now and uh, seeing how that that can be a provision for patient coverage. Yeah, that would be nice for patients if uh, if and when that happens. Yeah, uh, agreed. Agreed. I mean, I think it's such a, you know, it's a it's a big area, but I know that people are wrestling with, you know, maybe they don't want it covered. Right. I know that a lot of people are looking for it and they'd say we would prefer that it's not. So that way, you know, we have another area of specialization within our practice that we can get compensated for the actual services that we're providing. I mean, I, you know, there's arguments on both sides of the coin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's um, a great discussion over a bottle of wine. Yeah, yeah, just one. <laughs> just. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, 
But yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, the thing about medically necessary contact lenses, they are a big part of any given uh, practice. You know, a lot of individuals utilize that benefit. I think that the area of benefit that you can provide with your patient by staying cutting edge with the type of lenses. And, you know, we've certainly seen a lot of acceleration in the uh, scleral lens uh, arena over the last few years. And some of the things that new technology and eye molding and all of those different types of things are bringing, I mean, being able to provide clinical solutions for patients who've never had them before, I think is great. I think that we have to be, you know, on the other side, not only very progressive, always making sure we're, you know, treating our patients the very best to what they're entitled, but also understanding that the patient's coverage also has limitations that you're subject to accepting if you're a contracted provider. So, you know, my, my words in closing are kind of like, don't stop being a great clinician. Don't stop taking care of your patients. Just make sure you know what you're doing and what you're allowed to do in that given you know, uh, channel, if you will, with that particular carrier. And if that really doesn't meet your needs, don't break the rules, but maybe it's just a better business decision to say, I'm not going to be a member of that particular plan because I have X percentage of my revenues coming in uh, to my business and that outweighs, you know, the, the loss of that plan. I mean, it's a business decision, but don't make a, uh, a, um, one that would result in a civil penalty or a criminal penalty yeah. just because you have too much bravado to not want to comply. Right. I mean, yeah. I think that's where, you know, people end up getting in trouble and, you know, I couldn't, I, I would say this for as tangled of a web that much of billing, uh, you know, medical coding and billing is medically necessary contact lenses is actually very straightforward. Yes, it's a larger burden because there's not a uniform set of qualifications. But when you read the qualifications, they're very easy to understand on what needs to be in the record, what the patient needs to have to qualify, and then what conditions are covered. And so, you know, it's once you get to the policy, not a difficult thing to do. It's just difficult to stay up to date on all of them uh, that are out there and make sure that you're doing the right thing with the right patient. Yep. Um, absolutely. It is. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Some, some things that came to, uh, uh, to mind. Um, so we talked about, uh, we can't charge more than our usual and customary fees. Um, what are your thoughts on having uh, different usual and customary? So right now in our office, we have a universal, uh, contact lens evaluation fee, um, for, I'm going to say everyday contacts, right? You're, you're not your keratoconus, not your uh, mm-hmm. anything specialty. If I had a, a, a separate fee for anisometropia, contact lens uh, fitting, or a, um, a fee for anisoconia, uh, you know, contact lens fitting, um, most practices have a, a keratoconic, you know, fitting fee, yeah. especially lens fitting fee. Um, would that be appropriate? Is that gaming the system? It's kind of gaming the system. Um, so, you, you know, you're going to want to look at your contact lens codes, your fit codes, right? They, they're mm-hmm. generally in the area of 92310 to 92317 um, are the CPT code range of those. And unfortunately, that's not how the codes are broken down. The codes are broken down with, you know, we'll let's stay with the basic one, 92310 prescription of optical and physical characteristics and fitting of a contact lens with medical supervision and uh, 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 medical supervision of an adaptation, corneal lens, both eyes. Okay. That's what the, except for aphakia. So that's what the definition is. So the condition of aniso or whatever isn't mentioned in there. It's what type of lens are you fitting? And then you're going to go to, you know, fitting of a, you know, uh, a scleral lens, a corneal scleral lens, you're going to go fitting up a lens for aphakia, you know, uh, those types of things. But the, that's why you'll see in uh, many practices that what they have is a 92310, but many different levels of fits within the 92310. So I can take care of my RGP fit under that code, which may require more time and attention, a toric lens fit, a multifocal lens fit, those types of things. And 
most of the carriers are very amenable to being able to have different levels of 92310 based upon different types of lens fits, but not necessarily so much based upon the condition. It's going to be based upon the type of lens that's fit instead. That makes sense. Um, yeah. The, uh, cool. And, the, and, and um, oh, go ahead. Can I just make one, one note? Is mm-hmm. that to address, I, well, at some point before the conversation is over, just to address the contact lens follow up exam. Yeah. yeah. That we yep, talk about was, all the time. I was, <laughs> that was my next, uh, my, my next question, actually, uh, a, a two-parter. One, uh, just summarize what a good contact lens evaluation documentation looks like. Um, we learned it in school. We were joking earlier about boards. Uh, and so we, we all passed it at one point, but just what should we make sure we have noted down? And then on that, that the idea of my contact lens isn't finalized until... I'm ready to do the final prescription. Correct. Uh, now that may take one visit. That may take multiple visits. So what do each of those, and I'm assuming that's what, that's where I would classify the follow-ups. Yeah. What do those look like? So I guess I'd start off with, I mean, you know, you're going to want to have a good basic health assessment of the anterior segment, right? At the cornea, conch, you know, tear film, uh, all of those types of things. You're going to want to have obviously keratometry or topography, whatever you're choosing uh, to do on that. Um, I know a lot of individuals love doing anterior seg OCT as part of their fit. Um, if they're doing rigid lenses, just remember that if you're doing anterior seg OCT for that, the code for that is 92132. Um, That's a distinct and separate billable code, not to the medical carrier for the purpose of a contact lens fit or for a measurement of corneal thickness. But it's a great, if you're using that test, it is a separate element that you can use uh, to bill. Obviously, um, when you uh, are putting a lens on the eye, you want to note uh, visual acuities. You want to note the ocular response to it, you know, centration, movement. Uh, all of those types of things are very important um, to be able to uh, work with. You want to make sure that you're also showing a differential in your best corrected visual acuity, both uh, monocularly and uh uh, with both eyes at the same time. So that way you can demonstrate a, an improvement in doing things. So those are the types of things that you're going to want to see in a good contact lens fit that ends up in generating a prescription. So I can cover everything from, you know, uh, top to bottom, you know, my over refraction, all of those types of things. So that way I can see how did I arrive? What was, what were the clinical findings that allowed me to arrive at the final fit for that contact lens, which consists of what? Curvature, diameter, power, right? And and yeah. and why I'm able to solve that patient's individual problems that way. Um, with respect to the uh, contact lens follow-up, I guess I've never understood, um, and this goes back to the days when I was in clinical practice. I didn't do contact lens follow-ups right? I I did. I just didn't call them a contact lens follow-up because I was not really following up the contact lenses, right? I mean, I I have, again, I go back to the drug and the disease, the contact lens and the condition uh, analogy. When I'm seeing a patient, if a patient comes back in and they say, my contact lens is bothering me, my eye is red, the vast majority of our peers say, oh my God, I fit that patient within the last 12 months. Today's visit is free and it takes up 15 to 20 minutes on your schedule that you're not bringing revenues in. And I say, what's the cause of that patient's chief complaint? I've got redness of my right eye when wearing my contact lens. So what is my conditions? I've got edema, I've got hyperemia, I've got all those. I can now diagnose my condition, because remember, my job is what? Detect, diagnose, treat, right? So if I do that, all of my follow-up exams, because there's outside of managed vision care plans that will require a certain time period, right? After you fit the lens. But after that period is over, if a patient's returning because of a contact lens problem, now it's a medical related issue that I'm now billing the medical carrier for. No, the diagnosis isn't myopia. It's not astigmatism. It's not, you know, presbyopia. It's hyperemia, edema, whatever it may be caused from, you know, abrasion caused from, you know, the situation I have with the contact lens and I build a medical carrier for that. And that's what I think an appropriate contact lens 
uh, a patient dri- uh, patient complaint driven contact lens follow up should be is really a medically oriented visit because now I've got a response to something that I prescribed. Yep. Right? And that's that's I'm how 100% I I'm 100% on board. It. Yeah. I'm 100% you know? on board with that. And I'm yeah. glad you brought that up because in my mind a contact lens follow up is would would be when I do them is similar to a um an IOP check when I'm changing the 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 medication for glaucoma mm-hmm. is it working as intended? Right. right. I put somebody in a new multifocal. Is it working as intended? I see them back in, you know, a week or so. And um, so I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm directing mm-hmm. them back for that. And, right. uh, and quite frankly, if, if I'm doing it, it's my fit's not complete because I don't know if that's the lens I'm going to end up going with. That's correct. Um, and the minute that you're ready to comply with our federal contact lens rule that says you have to write a script yeah. for it, right? When you I'm do done. that, that's when your fit is complete. That's when your mm-hmm. 92310 or your 92313 or whatever contact lens fit code, that's when that code is now done. And now I'm now I'm not bound by anything other than a managed vision care rule, okay, if yep. I have that. But if I don't have that, I'm not bound by anything. And in any other patient-driven visit is going to be related to billing the medical carrier for the signs, symptoms, or ultimate diagnosis of what's wrong with that with that individual, and I think yeah. that's where you know people are leaving. I don't want to say a lot on the table, but you know they're they're probably not thinking it through completely because I think they, I don't know where we've gotten under the mentality. I know I, I certainly understand about the annual supply of daily disposable yeah. contact lenses. I get that all day long. But there's nothing to go with the fact of that I have to provide an annual care package for that yeah. patient as well, right? I, I don't, that part I don't necessarily agree with. So I know there's others that have differing opinions and, you know, maybe there's not a right or a wrong, but I, you know, you've heard the way I approach it. Absolutely. Well, and, and for what it's worth, I'm on team, John, when it comes to this, it's uh, if there's a problem after the fact, um, you know, if it's a prescription change, there's probably a reason for that. And if it's a healthy, you know, if it's an adult, it's, there, there's a medical reason for that. Typically, um, right. if the contact lens is no longer comfortable, right? There's typically a medical reason for that dry eye, change in medication. Was, you know, we know all of say, this, right? So all these things. Yeah. It's not the contact lens's fault, right? There's something right. else medically that I need to manage. Right. I I can't tell you, Aaron, how many people. Well, I mean, I hate to say build a very successful dry eye practice because you have all of these individuals that are on it, on the on the edge. And when they wear a contact lens, despite how good you are of a contact lens fitter and the technology of lens that you provided and, and all the new tech that's available in the contact lens materials, it tips people over into the mm-hmm. symptomatic range of dry eye. And so now that's something that you have to deal with as well. If you're a, you know, conscientious, uh, you know, provider that wants to take care of your patient's needs. Yes, the patient's desire to wear a contact lens technically could have caused them to be, you know, brought their symptoms to the forefront. Okay. I mean, that happens all day long in medicine with other types of things that we do, right? So why do we feel that we're obligated now to take care of their ocular surface disease because they're a contact lens patient of mine for no charge. I don't, that doesn't reconcile well with me. Right. Nope. Me neither. I'm i uh, I'm not a nonprofit and uh, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I went to a school that was not a nonprofit and they want their money. So yeah, that's uh, true. Right. It, that's right. It, it all goes down. Um, I know we're getting close to an hour. I, I wanted to uh, just address one, uh, one other thing. And, uh, well, I 100% agree with you that staying on top of all the different plans and all the different um, requirements or you know expectations from each of the different plans uh, for medically contact lenses in this case, but lots of other things is challenging. I think if you, you systematically break it down, it's not as, as big of a task as it feels. Um, and one thing that we did is uh, actually started in the optical because I wanted to know what, what benefits were in the optical. But for three months, I just kept a tally of all the different plans that we saw, which mm-hmm. whittled down the possibility of plans just to what I see. And I started with the most common ones and worked our way down to the least common ones. Some of them we only saw once, 
which mm -hmm. is great, but you know, it becomes less important. Mm -hmm. And then we just started looking at what each of those um, were. So we kind of built our own playbook based upon the game we're playing with the patients that we saw coming in. And from there, it became just twice a year, check and see if anything's changed. And that's really manageable all the way down. Yeah, I think that that's a fantastic strategy, actually an action plan to to take care of that potential problem. It's, um, it's very similar to approach I use with uh, clinics to understand which uh, insurance plans to join or not mm -hmm. join, right? And yeah. I think that, you know, if, if I were to take your plan and implement it, I would probably, you know, look at my top five that came in because I would, I would bet that the top five probably take care of 90% of your volume. And if you yeah. can stay on top of those once every six months, which would take no more than 15 minutes uh, to be able to do, I think, it, as you said, it becomes a, a takes a burdensome task and makes it very, very manageable uh, to be able to achieve. Yep. Oh, absolutely. And even if you, I mean, in your case, looking at the top five, top six, that's only updating one of them a month. That's an easy right. task for the doctor or your biller or to somebody to delegate to. It helps them yeah. look at, at, you know, the, any updates. So it's, it's very manageable once you yeah. break it down into bite-sized pieces. Um, yeah. uh, anecdotally, what we also found is that one of our most, you know, pain in the rear end plans um, that my staff complained all the time about, we only saw one or two of them in, in that three month right. period. So right. it was either stop complaining or we just drop the whole thing. But either way, it's not making us any money and we're not hurting any patients because we only saw right. two in three months. Right. Oh, Hey, that made me think of, uh, we were talking about something earlier on in the conversation. We were talking about what happens when I need to, not want to, need to prescribe a lens type that's high, that the cost of the lens is higher than the benefit. Oh, yes. Okay. So, again, not 100% successful, not the only way to skin the cat on this, but what I've found that's been very helpful in many situations is that, first of all, you have to exhaust other possibilities, right? You have to try a fit a lens, you know, that maybe under the formulary that they have and show that that doesn't perform as well as, or does not meet the needs, medical needs of the individual. And now when you're, you've found a lens that really is the best lens for that particular patient and their condition to manage it, and the cost is now higher than the benefit, write a letter of medical necessity. You can create a template, you know, that you can use in your office that you can then specify for each patient or fine tune, and then submit a copy of the invoice that you have for that particular material and submit that to the carrier. Yes, it's a paper claim. Yes, it takes a little bit more effort, but I have found in just about every case that I've recommended that approach to that they have gotten re the individuals gotten reimbursed for the cost of the material plus about ten percent. Not a huge profit oh. margin, but it is oh. it is taking care of the cost and covering you know your other costs of personnel, mail, ship, you know all those other types yep. of things uh, in it as well. So again, not foolproof, and I'm not telling you that that's an approved policy by any specific carrier. I've just found that that's been very successful when you try to communicate on behalf of the patient, showing that, you know, the allowed lenses have failed in solving the problem and you had to move to a different type of a lens in order to achieve the outcomes that patient required. Yeah, that sounds a lot like um, a prior authorization. It sounds and, like a uh, lot of uh, like a prior authorization, yeah. although it's typically, you know, it's kind of funny you think that it's done at the beginning of it, but it's. You know, th yeah. this was at the end of the process almost, you know, yeah. so. Well, the, um, no, that uh, is very helpful. And, and I think that, you know, the hearing that, the, you know, payers aren't out to, to be antagonistic towards us. I think they just are operating under a set of rules and, and defined. And, you know, we need to learn to speak their language and, uh, and understand what their goals are. And, you know, ultimately everybody's trying to take care of the patient and take care of all the patients that they, uh, yeah. they have responsibility for. That's that's right. And I think that, I mean, most of the audits that I've been involved with, uh, I don't want to say it in this derogatory type of a tone, but many times it's almost analogous to the provider, to the doctor saying, hey, come look at me. 
right? Because some of the behaviors that they're doing are so egregious that, you know, it's they're 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 making themselves noticeable rather than um, you know, not. So, nope. Well, that makes uh, that makes perfect sense, John. I appreciate, uh, as always, you taking time to uh, yeah. to help us tackle and uh, and address some challenging topics and uh, important great conversation. Topics. Absolutely. Um, so, the uh, your contact info will be in the show notes. So, if anybody has any questions, um, and I'll give a shout out to uh, to you and just ask John. Um, it's been a couple great. times this month where we've our office yeah, has reached out. Code safe. Some code safe plus. Has been a yep. that as well. We appreciate it back and help us uh, be compliant and, and quite frankly, also make more money. Um, when there we do the right thing nice, the right way. A nice combination. <laughs> Definitely. All awesome. right, Aaron. Thank you. Oh, until next time. Thanks.